Hey there, listeners. This is Justin with a quick note before today's episode. Audible.com is offering Beyond the Uniform listeners one free audiobook. You can see this offer, as well as a list of every book guests have recommended on the show, at beyondtheuniform.io slash books. That's beyondtheuniform.io slash books. Thanks and enjoy the show. Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and each week I interview military veterans about their civilian career. Today is episode number 74 with Christopher Perkins. Yeah, so I guess I, I leveraged the skills that I, that I learned in the Marine Corps, and literally I just started kicking in doors. When I got to New York, I, I had to figure it out, and I had to figure it out quickly. So again, it was all about establishing that network. Uh, I called people, I learned from them, and I started whittling down exactly what I wanted to do. There are things that a veteran can control, there are things that you can't control. I couldn't control my technical proficiency at the time because I just got out of the Marine Corps. But darn it, I could control how hard I could work. So I was the first one in every morning, I was the last one to go at night, and I was studying like crazy. The top three reasons to listen to today's show are, number one, senior finance. Christopher is at one of the most respected financial institutions in the world. So if you're at all interested in the finance industry, this is worth a listen. Number two, explanation. Christopher gives great advice on how a veteran can explain their background. He managed to land a senior position at Lehman Brothers directly out of the military. He did it by being an expert storyteller, and his advice for veterans is fantastic. Number three, financial collapse. Christopher talks about what it was like on Wall Street during the financial collapse and how his military training paid off, keeping him calm and stable when the world around him seemed to be falling apart. As always, at beyondtheuniform.io, you'll find show notes for this episode with links to everything we discuss and an overwhelming list of resources that will help you in your civilian career. You'll also be able to get a free audiobook of your choosing from audible.com. Check it out. And with that, let's dive in to my interview with Christopher Perkins. Well, joining me today in New York is Christopher Perkins. Uh, Chris, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Hey, thank you very much for having me. So quick background for listeners. Uh, Christopher is the managing director and the global head of OTC Clearing at City. He started out at the Naval Academy, after which he earned a Master's of Arts in National Security Studies from Georgetown University. He then served as an officer in the Marine Corps for over nine years. After the Marines, Christopher worked at Lehman Brothers as their U.S. Head of Derivatives Intermediation. He's also the co-founder of Veterans on Wall Street, an initiative dedicated to honoring former and currently current military personnel by facilitating career and business opportunities in the financial services industry. Um, so, Christopher, I, I always like to start out asking, um, at what point did you know you were going to leave the Marine Corps, and how did you approach that decision? Hey, Justin, thanks for the question. So it was back in 2004. I was in uh, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, uh, and experienced some of the the more difficult fighting uh, during the war in Iraq, Uh, pretty heavy urban urban combat. Uh, My unit took a number of casualties. Um, It was really uh, one of the highlights of my Marine Corps career, um, and it was an incredibly formative time for me. Um, and after that, I came back to California. I took command of an artillery battery and, and uh, was commanding 130 Marines and sailors. Um, at that time, I realized that m- most of my goals in the Marine Corps had been met. And the only thing I knew in my adult life was, was the military. And I was very interested to, uh, to, to move on and see what else was out there in life. And uh, I think when you come through uh, a really difficult combat period, you know, you really – uh, have a newfound respect for your life, and, and you really want to make the most out of it. And so I wanted to see what out there was out there. I wanted to jump into new challenges, and I made the decision to uh, to get out of, of, of the Marine Corps. Uh, it was a tough decision. I, I love the Marine Corps. I love it to this day. Uh, but I wanted to see what else was out there. Um, I think the first thing that I had to do when I made that decision in my mind that I wanted to, to move forward was I had to have a really strong heart-to-heart with myself. Uh, I had to think about who I wanted to be and and, and what I wanted to do. I had to think about what kind of career I wanted. Um, And from there, uh, I started looking at different industries, started reading books, and started slowly networking, um, trying to narrow it down a little bit. Uh, At the time, I had a brother-in-law who happened to be at Harvard Business School, and I called him up. I had no idea how to write a resume, and I think there's some really wonderful organizations now that will help 
prepare transitioning veterans. We didn't have that when I was transitioning. Uh, but I asked him to send me his, uh, his resume from, from Harvard Business School, and I used that format as a base. And then I reached out to you know, other people within my friends and really family network to start putting a resume together. Uh, I realized shortly that I wanted to, I was very interested in finance. Um, you know, over the years growing up, I grew up in New Jersey and, and was always attracted to the financial services industry and the excitement of Wall Street. And so, like Cortez, I burned the ships and I moved to, to New York. That's, that's great. And um, I, I know a lot of vets go into finance. I think it makes a ton of sense. I think that, um, you know, nearly every veteran has, is just off the charts in terms of hard work, determination, a, a lot of things that I think are necessary to be able to cut it in finance. But one of the things that stood out for me is you, you managed to go directly from the Marine, Marines, um, not just directly into finance, but you, you, um, obtained a pretty high up and very senior position at Lehman Brothers, and I'm just wondering how did you, how did you find your way to Lehman Brothers in particular, and how did you manage to um, go straight out of the military to such a great role? Yeah, so I guess I, I leveraged the skills that I that I learned in the Marine Corps, and literally I just started kicking in doors. Uh, when I got to New York, I, I had to figure it out, and I had to figure it out quickly. So. Again, it was all about establishing that network. Uh, I called people, I learned from them, and I started whittling down exactly uh, what I wanted to do. Um, from there, you, you start meeting people, then you try to get informational interviews, and I started getting in front of different people. And the next thing you know, I, I, I made it to Lehman Brothers uh, for my informational interview. I got there because, again, it all comes down to the network, right? I, I knew a Marine uh, from 1st Battalion, 3rd Marines. I served with them in Hawaii. And he had emerged as a very, very successful trader at Lehman. And so I tracked him down, and I called him up, and I said, Brian, um, you know, I'm really interested in a job at Lehman Brothers. And he said, hey, Chris, do you have a suit? And I'm like, yeah, I have a suit. He goes, do you have a resume? Yeah, I've got a resume. So he said, come on in for and, and talk to a few people. And so I did. And I found out, and I always knew it, that Wall Street at the time, um, it's still to this day, it's a very, very patriotic culture. And I walked in that trading floor, and the energy, the excitement was really appealing to me. And I, and I really felt like I was back in the Marine Corps, back in that COC, um, and, and I was really, uh, really attracted to, to, the, uh, to the culture. So then I sat down, and uh, I started talking to people. And next thing I know, I talked to another person. I think I probably met 12 people that day. And, and, and the challenge that I had was how, did I, how was I able to communicate and translate my skills into what they were after? And I remember a couple of things. They're like, hey, what do you do in the Marine Corps? And again, they were very patriotic and supportive. They'd never met a combat veteran before, and, uh, and they're trying to figure me out. And I said, well, what I do is kind of what you guys do, right? I, I, make, I was an artilleryman, and I said I make very quality, quantitative and, and accurate decisions, and I understand risk. But if I get my risk wrong, people die. If you get your risk wrong, you lose some money, right? And I think that theme really resonated with them. And uh, then one guy noticed that I had a degree in national security studies. And he goes, uh, are those my securities or your securities? And I said, oh, they're my securities. But we can make it work. <laughs> um, fr from there, uh, they, they were interested in offering me a job. And uh, I said, look, I want to be part of the associate class. I had done enough research to understand the different programs, and I wanted to become part of a class. I had a master's degree because the classes allow you to be trained, um, be part of a community, and it would be much easier than just putting me on a desk and setting me off. And at the time, Lehman said, well, we don't do that. You know, we give our associate positions to you know, only top MBAs, and you're clearly not an MBA. And I remember I talked to them, and I said, and I don't know, they bought it, and we'll give it a shot. <laughs> and the fact of the matter is, yeah, the fact of the matter is that at the time the markets were were really ripping, um, and they they could afford to take a chance on a very very hungry aggressive uh, veteran. And the next thing I knew, I was in the associate class at Lehman Brothers, there with essentially the valedictorians and the top picks, class of about thirty, and uh, and, and there I was. Um, Immediately, I realized that I had some things that I brought them some things to the table that they didn't have, and they brought some things to the table that I didn't have, and it was uh, it was really interesting. Um, and I immediately had to just leverage again the Marine Corps and all the skills that I that I that I attained. I worked around the clock, 
I'd never taken an accounting class before, and I had to pass accounting for this associate class. And, and I worked my tail off. I passed it. I passed a series seven. Um, and then off I went uh, to go around these rotations where, you know, you try to, um, you know, get your job and land on your desk. And at the time, and, and, and I think people will, will understand the history here, all the other associates, they were dying to get into mortgages. Everyone was making a killing on mortgages. And I took a different tact. I, I, I was looking for people because I knew I didn't know that much from a technical perspective. And I needed to be around people that could really train me and get me up to speed. And so I found an interesting desk. It was called uh, Derivatives Intermediation at the time. And all I knew about it was that it was, they did a lot with hedge funds and they did a lot with derivatives. And, and both of those you know, words and ideas appealed to me. I thought it would be kind of cool. Wasn't entirely sure what I was getting into, but the people were awesome. And they, they expressed a strong interest in me. And I, I knew that when I landed on that desk that you know, I, I, would, I would have a chance to be successful. That's awesome. I mean, it's it's just really impressive to um, I I admire your courage and not only making a leap that that I think for a, for most people is pretty far from the military to go straight into finance, but then to not only have the courage to do that, but the courage and audacity to to convince them to let you into an associate class to to to, to have that focus to know that that's what you wanted. You did your homework. And then you had the courage to like push for it and ask for it, and um, I think both of those are just really ad- admirable and really good examples for listeners about how to to really advocate for yourself for what you want. Yeah, I, that's totally the case. Y- you have to be your own best advocate. But, and I'll talk about it in a second. But we've made a lot of a lot of strides in developing support networks, whether they're military veterans networks or other. Um, veteran support organizations, there are a lot of people out there. You can't do it by yourself, and they will help you along. And it's just a matter of connecting with them, clearly articulating in your direction of travel, your goals. And, and frankly, there's a whole community of people that veterans don't even know about that are just waiting to help them out. That's awesome. That's great. Well, um, how would you explain your, excuse me, your role as the U.S. head of derivatives intermediation, and especially what that life looked like on a day-to-day basis. I think it's always helpful for listeners to have that portrait, that view of, of um, kind of what the, the, the granular life looked like and experiences were like when, when you were in that role. Yeah, so when I started on the desk, I knew that I had to get my technical proficiency up. And uh, the first thing I did was I worked really, really hard. I would get up, I'd be the first in. Like there are things that a veteran can control. There are things that you can't control. I couldn't control my technical proficiency at the time because I just got out of the Marine Corps. But darn it, I, I, could, tr- I could control how hard I could work. So I was, in, I was in the first one in every morning. I was the last one to go at night, and I was studying like crazy. Uh, I, would, I ripped apart. I learned all about risk management, uh, things we call the Greeks. Uh, and then my manager said, you know, it would really help you if you studied the, uh, for the CFA, uh, which is a test – that, that you can take a certified financial analyst. It's a very difficult test that you can take that really uh, brings your technical proficiency up to speed. And so I would study for that at night and before work and uh, ended up taking that test. Meanwhile, the, the desk that I landed on was a startup. It was very entrepreneurial. And the one thing people don't realize about finance is that we are very diverse. Uh, there are businesses within the firm that are very mature and then there are businesses that are startups, and I joined a startup, and I, you know, I, didn't know it, I didn't really know it at the time. And so we were building a business from scratch, and I was – anytime you join a startup, you pretty much do everything, right? Um, I was looking at risk management. I had to understand operations. I had to understand uh, the P&L, and I really got my hands really dirty um, and knew the guts of, of this business that we were building out. And it was a, it was a new business that was being built out across the – across Wall Street where clients trade derivatives and, and what we would do is we would essentially uh, be the counterparty for all the derivatives that they traded and we can give them some additional services. So next thing you know, uh, about a year and a half goes by and my boss decides to quit. And he did so pretty abruptly. I was on vacation at the time. This is kind of a very unique niche type uh, business. We have to uh, we have to find someone who, does, who can run it. And uh, you know, as a good Marine, I raised my hand and said, well, I can do this. I, I, I know the guts of the business. It's a new business. No one has experience in it. No one has more experience than me at this point. Uh, I can run it. And it appealed to me at the time, like leadership, 
in the Marine Corps is easy. You, you learn it, and you're used to being thrust into very uncertain situations. From there, I was able to build the business out, and I think when I started, it was very young. We had like four clients. Um, I was growing very quickly. Uh, I had over 30 clients, 35 clients. Things were going great, and then we went bankrupt, and this was another very formative period in my development. Uh, going through a, a bankruptcy, it was a lot like having that experience in, in, in war. Um, people, there was incredible stress. For me, I had perspective. It, it was amazing because, you know, people had been in the industry their whole careers and never had experiences like that. And now I was acquiring um, these new experiences. Um, interesting thing, the next day, I got a call and it was from City. And City said, Would you like a job? And I said, Well, what kind of package do you have? And they said, It's a great package, it's a job. And so I called my wife and I said, City is, is offering me a job. This this is great. She said, Well, you better get over there quickly. And I did. So the next day I started working at City. Um, and it, what an amazing experience it was for me because and I started running the derivatives prime brokerage there. And so now I had this really unique experience. And I, I, I feel like I was like that last corporal who had been in the Marine Corps for, you know, a few weeks or months, who had been in combat for the first time. There was a, you know, a colonel who had never experienced combat. Now I had experienced combat, and, um, and, and it was an incredible experience. That's awesome. I mean, I love, I love just the thought of how amidst something that was on a global scale very traumatic and how – I'm, I'm imagining from your experience in the Marine Corps, just keeping your head and in, in keep, like you said, keep it in, in perspective and remaining calm and, and, and keeping things under control. And then how that led to such an amazing opportunity. And I think that that's often the case in, in, in careers that some things that could be viewed as like the biggest catastrophe and worst thing ever to happen often turns into the unexpected best opportunity that we have in life. And so I love that you, um, you saw that opportunity and you took it. And, um, and then I also just really appreciate your perspective where looking at, at that, the, wealth of experience that you learned through that and were able to bring with you to city. It's really, uh, really incredible. Hey, thanks. And so from there, things got kind of interesting because the whole world was being turned upside, upside down. And in the aftermath of Lehman Brothers, there was uh, a tremendous amount of regulation, laws that were passed. And the G20 in 2009 completely changed the way that derivatives were to be traded. And it just so happens that that startup that I was working on in Lehman, um, suddenly after Dodd-Frank and, and the European equivalent, actually all throughout the world, that little startup actually became the law. And next thing I knew, I was in the middle of a business that had to figure out how to handle, in a very short period of time, the central clearing of, of, of an industry that was over $700 trillion in size. And again, I was a relatively junior employee. I raised my hand and I said, you know, I can do this. Um, I may only have been in finance for a few years, but uh, I'm a leader. I've commanded 130 Marines and sailors. I know the guts of this business because, I, you know, I built it from scratch. Uh, give me an opportunity. And City was tremendous. They, they gave me a shot. Um, they said, okay, we want to be the best at this in the world. I want you to go out and hire the, the best people you can find, and we're going to invest – a lot of money. Uh, I want you to build the best technology in the world. Um, as the business started, it was very competitive. Um, every single client needed to have this service because it was the law. It was coming very quickly. And what would happen is they would call all the banks in. We would all line up, maybe eight or ten of us, and we would have to present to them on our product. Uh, so back in 2009 or so, I, would, I remember I'd come in and I'd say, hey, Chris Perkins, I've got this product. Uh, we have the best people. We've got the best technology. We're going to be the best at this. And at the time, our, uh, as a counterparty, City was maybe not as strong as some of the others. And I said, and, and the guy after me would come in and say, hey, I am this bank. I'm Fortress Balance Sheet. I'm the strongest in the world. Uh, you have to do business with me. And so what we did was we really created a culture of just absolute client service Everything is uh, everything's come together, and 
the, at the same time, something else was going on in my professional career that was really important, and that was the formation of the Veterans Networks at City, which has been a huge part of my professional career and really helped me with my professional success. So in 2009, I raised my hand and I said, look, we should have a military veterans network here at City. And the firm listened to me and they said, you know what, I, th I think we'll do that. And so I wrote my bylaws and, and when I launched, and again, when I made the transition, I found people were very patriotic, but there was no institutionalization of that support. So it was very hard for veterans to grasp onto something as they were transitioning. Uh, it was very informal. And this was an attempt to, to, to really formalize and institutionalize the support of vets. Um, I found out that City was founded to fund the War of 1812. That was kind of cool. And, and I remember during my launch ceremony for the first network here in New York City, Dick Parsons showed up, who was chairman of the board. And he really didn't talk about it, and no one really knew it, but Dick was a vet. He was an Army vet, and he spoke. And by establishing that institution of a veterans network, and, and our job was to recruit, retain, mentor, and provide community outreach, it provided a, a, something for people to latch onto. And I found out that throughout the firm, very senior people, that maybe their dad was in World War II, um, maybe their cousin was deployed, um, people came out of the woodwork to support this network. And in the beginning, I thought we were going to have about 100, 125 people. That was my plan. Uh, if you fast forward to today, we have 16 networks across the globe. We opened one in the UK. We are an absolute force of nature. In addition to that, we decided that the, the networks are great, but uh, we can do more as a, as, a, as a company. And we launched something called City Salutes, which... Um, is a one-stop shop. We have a web page. It was our firm-wide initiative to help veterans and their families. In fact, recognizing the value that veterans bring, we, not because we're doing charity, like my firm does not exist. We're, we're not a 5013C. We're not here to do charity. We want to recruit those veterans because we think it's good business. And we've been able to, uh, we get better every year. It's something that really excites us. Finally, uh, also, back in the early days when we started forming, right after we formed the network, we got together uh, with a couple of senior people here at City, and we said, you know what, we can do something across this industry for vets, and we can put aside our competitive differences and, so, and, and help veterans first and foremost. We invited a number of our bank peers over to uh, City Fields here in New York, and we tried to establish a forum to share best practices really around recruiting. A couple of years later, I'm sorry, a couple of weeks later, uh, Deutsche Bank approached us and said, hey, we want to do something for the industry for vets. And we said, so do we. Uh, we took their name, and it's now known as VOWS, or Veterans on Wall Street. This is another amazing reference for a, a, a resource, I'm sorry, for transitioning veterans. Uh, VOWS is now an organization of banks. We set out, um, and we had two goals. Number one was to do symposiums to help transitioning vets. We've done a number of hiring fairs. And we also were Wall Street, right? So we tried to raise money. We found out very early on we're, we're pretty good at raising money. We raise over a million dollars a year. And we had these symposiums. And over the years, we decided to embark upon a strategic relationship with the Bob Woodruff Foundation. And uh, we've had a number of, of, uh, of career hiring fairs. Uh, about, a couple, about two years ago, we decided to expand our membership beyond just banks. And we're now about 90 firms across financial services and beyond and our goal is to share best practice, practices, raise money, and also help veterans and their families with the transition. So think about the value of that veterans network through VOWS. Um, so anyway, those, those are the two progressions of my career. I was, I was running this, uh, derivatives, this, this industry leading derivatives clearing business and simultaneously uh, working on the, on the military veterans initiatives. They crossed often as well. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many clients of mine are veterans or uh, have a close affiliation with a veteran, and it's just easier to do business. That's incredible. And, and um, you know, I just appreciate so much of what you've done to, to pay things forward and to help the veteran community. And one of the things I was wondering about is between your work uh, with Veterans on Wall Street as well as Cities Military Veterans Networks, I just imagine you've, you've um, worked with so many different veterans in finance. And I'm, I'm curious, what, um, what's like the biggest advice that you would want to give to either veterans who are currently in finance or veterans who are considering a career in finance? Yeah, I, I really enjoy my career in finance, and I, th I think it's exciting for, for any veteran. Uh, when you say finance, it's, a, it's again, it's very diverse. 
We have everything from investment bankers to project managers to operations people uh, to people in call centers and even tellers, right? So it's, it's very important if, if somebody's considering a career in finance um, to really understand what exactly it is that they want to do. And the first thing that we do is, is you know, reach out to the Veterans Network locally. And again, at City, we've got 16 of them across the U.S. Uh, reach out to VALS. Uh, we have a website, you know, try to find us. And the, the whole goal there is to begin networking to really find out what it is that you want to do. And I guarantee you, most veterans will have an informational interview with, with anyone. Um, so, so take them up on that. Uh, network, network, network. And, and really, it starts with finding out what you want to do. Once you find out what it is you want to do and you're, and you're sure that your talents align with it, then it's time to really dig in. Start kicking in those doors and, and, and pushing for results. You, know, you, you need to demonstrate a passion. You need to have technical competency. You, know, you need to bring yourself up to speed. Because when we hire veterans, I'll tell you, the, the thing that, 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 um, that, did, that some of them do poorly is they'll come in here and they say, well, what should I do? And it's not for any of us to answer. But once a veteran understands what they want to do, you know, we will help them get there. And I think the most important thing that we're looking for, we, we know they're not going to be experts in finance. That's, that's not why we're going to hire them. We're looking for people that are hungry, people that are smart, um, people that will leverage all those skills they acquired in the service uh, to help our teams perform better. And, you know, the technical stuff is stuff that, that can be achieved through hard work. Um, and most veterans, if, if they have that trait, and they should, they can get up to speed pretty quickly. So we want someone who's passionate and who's going to come in and, and really add value to our team as soon as possible. And, and are there any common mistakes that you see veterans make or any common misconceptions they have um, when, it, when it comes to finance? We want to make sure that the fit is right for the veteran, and we want to make sure that the fit is right for us. Uh, Starting off, there's two things that they need to really focus on. Um, and then, of course, we like to see people who know what they want, and then we will help them get there. And, and we are very focused on not letting veterans fail. That's awesome. And and one thing I wanted to ask about is, and, and you touched on this briefly already, but um, the the value of an MBA um, in, in working up the ranks within within finance and I, I know this is generalities but given um you know you had a master's before but you chose not to pursue that route for a vet who's getting out right now and they don't have an advanced degree how would you advise them to think about whether or not to, to try to pursue an mba or go directly into finance in terms of i, I don't know maybe pros and cons on on either path yeah it's, it's a very very good question so starting off with an MBA, um, MBAs are awesome because once you have that education, nobody can ever take it away from you, right? And the other thing that an MBA gives you is it gives you an, a, it further augments your network, right? So you're part of an MBA class. There are people out there that you're connected to and you network with. There is tremendous value uh, in attaining an MBA. I didn't have an MBA. I had, an, I had a master's degree. The, the downside, if there is, uh, with an MBA is that it takes time to get one. Um, so for me, I was in my 30s. I didn't want to go back to school. I wanted to jump right into it. Um, if you want to take a couple of years, uh, by all means, go there. And the other good thing about having an MBA is it gives you time to think, and it gives you more time to find that right fit for you. You meet more people, uh, and you could drill into it. Um, it comes with some costs that you need to evaluate, but the GI Bill has gotten much better in that regard. Alternatively, if you want to go straight into, um, into, into, into a job, I think you have to expedite you know, your decision-making process. You have to have that heart-to-heart heart, heart heart with yourself, and you have to know exactly what you, what, you, what you want to get into. I always think it's helpful to try and lay out for listeners, um, just I guess broadly speaking, possible career paths to a position like managing director at a company like City, and I, I'm wondering, um, it's helpful for them to hear your story. But if you if you know of like, are there other typical routes that one would take, um, or backgrounds that one would have if their aspiration was to one day be a, a, a managing director? Yeah, I, I think it you have to you have to to grow where you're planted, 
right? And so once you find that desk, the, the, the key to, to becoming a managing director is to, is to grow where, where you're planted. So um, you have to start working really hard. You need to start adding value. You have to understand the goals and the mission, like just like the Marine Corps, you have to know the mission of the desk and the mission of higher headquarters. So what, what, is, what does their boss want? And then you have to drive that, that mission forward. I think it starts with understanding the business model, understanding the regulatory complex, and then really driving the P&L. Um, uh, relationships are incredibly important, whether they're client relationships or whether they're internal relationships. And of course, you have to also be mindful of, of risk management and compliance. Um, so that's the key. And, and you, you never stop networking. You never stop growing. You never stop studying. Uh, the markets are are incredibly complex. Nobody knows everything there is to know about them. And so it just takes a massive amount of hard work, uh, studying, and, and again, that word passion. And and I think it's also helpful to to just for the listener to understand what what your life is like. What is what is your day to day life look like? What are some of the if if there were a typical day, what would it look like? Sure, I, I wake up about five o'clock every morning, and I'm very excited to get to work. I have my first call uh, probably around five thirty five forty five with Singapore, and I find out what happened overnight. Um, from there, I, I, I come into the office. I'm, I'm at my desk before 6.30. Uh, I'm immediately on the phone with London. Um, I look at the markets. I look at my risk. Um, I find out any, any issues that happened overnight in, in the European markets or in, in, this, in the Asian markets. Uh, from there, I, I work the U.S. day. Uh, what do I do typically? I, I could be meeting clients. I could be managing my risk. Uh, you know, I, I'm responsible as managing director of my product. I'm responsible for everything my product does or fails to do. And, you know, there are things maybe away from me that, that, that occur. And, and if there's a fire, I go to put it out. Uh, but generally speaking, what I'm doing is I'm driving my business model forward. Uh, I'm coordinating with uh, my management and, and my manager sits over in London and um, I work the U.S. day. On the way home, I'm on the phone with Australia. They get in the office around 4.30, 5 o'clock at night. And then I'm speaking to, uh, you know, as, as the Japanese get in, I'm on the, the phone with that team, and we are driving our business model forward. I travel uh, pretty regularly. So the, the market that I, I work in is, is a global market. I spend uh, about a week out of the month on the road. I'm, I'm generally overseas. Uh, when I go overseas, I'm speaking to my clients about the product that I run. I'm speaking to regulators, uh, government officials, uh, speaking about, you know, the business that I run is relatively new. Laws went into effect in around 2011. Some of them are still getting implemented. So I'm working uh, with industry forums to try to make this business, this new business work uh, with a big focus on risk management. Um, and, you know, you travel, you try to also develop your people and, and drive your P&L. It's, it's really exciting. And um, it has its challenging. It has its challenges. Uh, the hours can be very long. Uh, but again, I really like what I do, and, and I really enjoy working for this firm. It's uh, it's it's so compelling hearing when you have um, a, an organization of city scale where you're truly a global organization. It's just incredible to hear the touch points throughout your day where you're leveraging that. Where you know it sounds like you're like you're literally waking up and getting a brief from someone on the other side of the world who's been up all night and they're able to feed you that information and it's just it just must be so amazing to have so many resources at your disposal like that and have an organization that has um such a, a diverse and and global team totally and and the the marine corps really helped me i mean we were overseas all the time and so it's uh and again when you travel for me it's like being in the field uh you don't sleep that much you really focus on work and when you come back from a trip you know it, it feels really good for what you accomplished um you know one thing just off the cuff that i'm wondering is um i'm wondering if you have any recommendations for resources and i'm just thinking of like either books or um uh podcasts or programs or websites or or um, anything that helped you or that you've seen help others at like Vets on Wall Street that you would recommend to a, vet, a veteran listening who's interested in finance or, or interested in improving their career some way, some way that they could um, check out today? Yeah, I think, I mean, there, there are a number of different books um, to like things like Market Wizards. 
there, there's so much to read, right? But you can almost start by, you know, reading things like the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, um, and then like, you know, you can watch CNBC, you can watch Bloomberg Television, and and sometimes you can, you know, by by watching those current events and watching how current events impact markets, you can kind of get a feel if that's for you, that intensity is, is for you. Uh, but again, I really think the best, if you, if you have any kind of desire to be in financial services, I really compel any listener, you know, find one of us, reach out to us. And we're, we're all over the, the website, go on LinkedIn and meet us, sit with us. There's nothing better than sitting down next to a guy on a desk or a lady and, and understanding what their life is like and, and ask them. But to me, that's the most, that's the most important experience that, that someone can have. And also understand the business model, like how, what's a good day? What's a bad day? How do you get paid in this industry? It's something that nobody really likes to talk about, but you need to know. Um, and then what's the quality of life? And, and I always also like to ask about um, challenges that, um, that veterans face in their transition. And I'm, this could be from your own transition from the Marines to civilian life or from all the different vets that you've worked with and mentored, but I'm wondering um, what what challenges vets face in their transition, or or what's surprising, something that they don't expect about that civilian life that listeners might be a little bit more aware of. I mean, there there are a number of, of challenges uh, that, that that you experience when 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 you get out of the service. Uh, you immediately lose that tribe that you may have had, that unit cohesion. And you can be thrust out into your own very quickly. And I think one of the challenges that a lot of vets have is that, okay, they served in the Marine Corps or wherever for four years, five years, whatever. You don't save up a lot of money when you're in. And then, you know, a few, a few weeks later, you're out of the Marine Corps. And the first thing that you need to do is you need to eat and you need to find a place to live. And these are very basic things that, that you need to solve for. Some people have families. And one of the challenges that we have is that as veterans transition out, because they have to, to feed their families, feed themselves, and get that, that roof over their head, is that they are underemployed. Um, and to me, that's one of the biggest challenges that, that a lot of veterans face. So they, they get out, they get that job just so they can sustain. But the goal for you is not to get a job, but to find that career. Find a career where you can start and you can grow it out and something that you can you can really embrace for, you know, a good part of your life. That's great. And no, I think that's um, in, incredible advice. And, um, you know, I, I want to keep the last question just to get your final words of wisdom. But um, I guess the, the last question I would ask is, um, you know, you, you had talked at, about at the start where you joined this group of associates and um, you, you had said there was ways in which I was ahead and there was ways in which we, and they were ahead and we learned from each other. And that's something I'm always curious to know about is kind of the ways in which veterans feel most behind when they start their career. So I'm wondering what, what were some of the ways in which you felt like um, you were ahead of, of those associate peers when you started out at Lehman Brothers and then some of the ways that you felt behind and had to learn from them? It was so foreign to me uh, when I started moving up through the ranks, and I remember I was at director's training, and there were people that I was with, and they were so nervous about managing people. And in the industry, it takes a little bit of time before you start managing people, and, and that first experience of managing a single person really was daunting for them. Um, I, that really was hard for me to, to register because I was used in, in, in the service, you you're get so used to managing and also leading. And so I was able to share tips with them on how to run organizations, how to efficiently run organizations, how to establish governance, how to establish leadership teams, how to effectively communicate. And these are things that are, frankly, you take it for granted when you're in the service, but they're very hard to teach, very hard to teach. And it's also very hard to teach things like how to act when, they're, when, you're, under, when you're under fire, you know, how do you continue to perform your mission? These things are very, very difficult. What I didn't have was all that technical proficiency. While I was running around Ramadi, you know, these guys and ladies were sitting at a desk. They were learning models. They were learning finance, and, and I had no exposure to that. Uh, like I said earlier, the great news about, about the technical side of things is it's very much within one's control. You, know, there, you can dive into a CFA program. There is so much 
um, academia available online now for even free of charge. So if you have the will and you have the, uh, the work ethic, you can develop that technical proficiency very, very quickly. That's incredible. And, and, um, you know, I wanted to make sure I had ma- I made room just to open it up for you to share anything that we didn't cover. And I know I asked a lot of uh, questions, but I also didn't ask a lot of questions that I'm sure you have, um, great advice around. So knowing that you have a, a group of veterans listening to this show, um, what would you want to share with them? It could be about personal life or professional life, but what would be your, your final words for them? Yeah, so when I made the transition, it was uh, I found out that the community, and, and my experience was finance, but I would argue that most industries are like that. I found out that people were, were very patriotic and they wanted to help, but there was very little structure. Um, if you fast forward to today, you'll find that we've much, we're much better organized as an industry, whether it's through my veterans networks here, whether it's through VOWs. Um, there are a number of other things uh, uh, that have popped up. There are plenty of veteran service organizations as well, ones that specialize in helping transition veterans to find jobs, right? So just do a little bit of research, and I think it's a lot easier to tap into uh, those resources out there, all willing to help you, and and make sure that you navigate to them. Um, find a mentor as well. I, I, I couldn't have ever done any of my transition alone. I had people help me along the way. And, and make sure that you find the right types of mentors. I mean, people, people that I approached was in finance, some were Vietnam vets. And, you know, they had been through a lot, and, and it, but they were willing to give me their time. And so, you know, network like crazy, tap into those organizations that now exist, find that senior mentor, and uh, you'll you'll do just great. I think that's such great advice. And um, I know one one theme that's come up on the show is how difficult it can be, or um, counter to a veteran's nature to ask for help, and how in the military that's often you know the one thing that makes vets so great is they're able to break through walls independently and with teams and just kind of do whatever is asked of them. And so that thought of asking for help or seeking a mentor can at first seem pretty foreign. And I, I think that you're so spot on on that of the value of finding someone much more further down the line from to learn from and to learn from the mistakes they've made and the successes they've had and to borrow all those years of experiences and thousands and thousands of hours of experience to, to help inform you on your own path. So I think that's just um, really great advice for, for listeners. Uh, thank you. Well, Christopher, thank you so much for your time. I, I can only imagine how busy you are, but I appreciate, um, one, I appreciate the, the work that you've done to help out other veterans, and you've just been so proactive in doing that. And I also appreciate the role model that you are as you forge the way ahead on the forefront of finance, in the, in the forefront of city, and you just um, really are a, a, an example for many other veterans for what someone can do achieve outside um, once they transition out of the military. So thank you for both of those. Uh, my pleasure, and, and thank you, Justin, for uh, for this interview. I really appreciate it. Surface, surface, surface. Thanks for listening. Three important notes before you go. First, Audible.com is offering a free audiobook for Beyond the Uniform listeners. I love Audible. I get three books a month, and it's a great way to use net, or no extra time, to polish off books while you run, drive, etc., if you go to beyondtheuniform.io slash books, you'll not only find this offer, but you'll also find a list of every single book that has been recommended on this show. One in particular I'd recommend is The Hard Thing About Hard Things. This is a great story of determination and also a glimpse at what startups are really like. That's at beyondtheuniform.io slash books. Second, there are so many great resources out there for veterans. It can be difficult to know all about them. That's why at beyondtheuniform.io slash directory, you'll find a list of every single resource that's been mentioned on the show or that I've been able to find. You can also add your own if you find one I've missed. Lastly, I've put together several different free ebooks that provide data for veterans about their civilian career possibilities. This quantitative information serves as a great complement to the qualitative interviews I do each week. Go to beyondtheuniform.io, click on resources, and you'll be all set. Have a great week, and I'll be back next week with more interviews with military veterans about their civilian career.